Hey Roots fam. Many years ago when I lived in Boston, I went to the movies with a friend and mentor named Matt Gibson. Shout out to Matt. It wasn't just any movie either. It was the highly anticipated, long awaited blockbuster by a famous director. And it was shot with this new 3D technology. And so we saw it in the IMAX theater. That movie was Avatar. Remember that movie? Now, Avatar is pretty problematic for a lot of reasons, uh, not least of which is this white savior trope, but that's for another sermon. Right now what I'm talking about is the way that that movie was made combined with the IMAX 3D experience was so powerful that as we left the theater, I actually felt like I needed some time to re-enter reality. I was so immersed in the world of Pandora from the movie that the real world started to feel like a foreign place for several minutes after the movie ended. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever been so engrossed in the movie that it creates a difficulty to go back to the real world? That's what movies at their best do. They draw us into a new world and shape our world view. Stories situate us and guide us. They map our world and they direct our steps. We are not only being formed daily by the practices in which we participate, we're also being formed daily by the stories we inhabit. And that's why this week, Roots' teaching team is kicking off a new series on the parables of Jesus during the season of Eastertide, which leads up to Pentecost Sunday. We're calling this series Ears to Hear. Jesus used stories to immerse us in a different world Long before there was James Cameron or Avatar or even movies, Jesus was a master storyteller and he used his stories to invite people to inhabit the kingdom of God. An altogether different story about an altogether different world that is still breaking into our world even now. We're going to be taking a look at these enigmatic stories of Jesus because today we're tempted to inhabit stories that aren't the story of the kingdom of God. So the parables of Jesus are a reminder of our unique story as God's people caught up in God's love, joined with Christ and the body of Christ as prophetic witnesses, ambassadors, and ministers of reconciliation. So this week we're going to take a look at Jesus' master parable, the parable about parables, about what he's up to as he's telling parables. It's the parable of the sower. But before we do that, join me in a word of prayer for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are the one who gives us eyes to see and ears to hear. Would you shine your light of illumination on the scriptures today and allow us to see what it is you want us to see? Would you open our spiritual ears to hear your voice? May the word be like a seed that finds good soil implants itself deep amongst our community and bears lasting fruit. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, so the parable we're going to be exploring today is found in all three of the synoptic or parallel gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we're going to be hearing from the version found in Mark. If you uh, have your own translation of the Bible, you're welcome to follow along in that. Or you can follow along with me. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, starting from chapter 4, verse 1. Here we go. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and he sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. 
When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him what, about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things comes in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now, one of the most common misconceptions people have about Jesus' parables is that they are moralistic lessons. Like a parent that wants to teach a child not to lie. They might tell the child the story of the boy who cried wolf. And that's what a lot of people think that Jesus' parables are like. And there's some reason why this misunderstanding is common. Jesus' stories do have ethical implications. But that's a byproduct of Jesus' intent. It's not his primary motive. The primary purpose of Jesus' parables was to invite people to inhabit the inbreaking kingdom of God, which he was presently ushering in. Jesus went around healing the sick, casting out demons, and forgiving sins. He, when he did this, he was demonstrating the kingdom of God, the reign of God, where people aren't sick because they live in wholeness, where people aren't plagued by demons because they live in the freedom of the Spirit, where people aren't oppressed by sin because they live reconciled to God and each other. Jesus' parables are part of how he's proclaiming and demonstrating God's reign to people. Not only did Jesus go around healing people and casting out demons, but he also shared scandalous table fellowship with those who were considered sinners by the religious leaders. This led to people questioning Jesus' ethics. In their worldview, a holy man like Jesus should never share table fellowship with such people. So how could he justify this? Jesus' parables were a way of shifting people's paradigms, inviting them to inhabit his world, which put the world gone wrong right side up again. But Jesus' parables aren't direct, and that's frustrating it was frustrating for some of his original hearers, and it's frustrating for some of us today. We often wish that Jesus had just cut to the chase, got to the point, and told us exactly what we're supposed to do. But that's actually part of the genius of Jesus' parables. Jesus had a way of influencing us that was far more powerful than just directly commanding us. Jesus' parables perplex us, and this is by design. Jesus' parables hit us sideways, they get under our skin, and they swim around in our brains. Jesus' parables intrigue us, they aggravate us, and they stick with us. N.T. Wright put it like this, when Jesus said, if you've got ears, then hear, this should alert us to the fact that he meant, I know this isn't obvious, you're going to have to think about it. Jesus wanted them to struggle with what he was saying, to talk about it among themselves, to think it through. You see, Jesus isn't going to spoon-feed us the answers. Not because he doesn't want us to know them, but because he's wise, patient, and loving. Jesus is seeking our development, not just our compliance. Jesus doesn't want disciples who are mindless drones. He wants disciples who are passionate learners, apprentices who are seekers and critical thinkers. But not only do Jesus' parables perplex us, but they also confront us. 
Even though Jesus' parables weren't moralistic lessons, they nevertheless expose our ethical shortcomings. Like when the Torah expert tried to justify his disdain for certain people and asked Jesus, who exactly is my neighbor? Jesus told a parable that exposed the way that he was thinking about the command to love your neighbor all wrong. Jesus' parables have a way of confronting by contrasting God's kingdom with our expectations. One time Jesus was at a dinner party with religious leaders who commented that the dinner party itself was like the kingdom of God. Instead of saying, no, it's not, Jesus told a parable that contrasted their gathering of privileged men with a gathering of the marginalized. He confronted them by contrasting the kingdom he was bringing with their expectations of the kingdom. And this is how he shifted people's paradigms. In fact, this is brilliant because if Jesus had simply confronted leaders like that directly and said to them, in effect, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, that very well could have shortened his ministry by years. Remember when what happened when he read that passage of scripture in his hometown synagogue? He came right out and said that it was presently being fulfilled by him, and they tried to stone him. So by speaking in parables, confronting people indirectly, Jesus not only gives people space for paradigm shifting, but he also buys himself time. But the parables of Jesus have another purpose that is really important for us today. Not only did they perplex and confront, they also immerse. Like a 3D IMAX experience, Jesus' parables about the kingdom of God invite us into an alternate reality where tiny mustard seeds become giant trees, where a father runs to welcome a shame-ridden son home, where the feared and despised other becomes the hero of the story, and where the son is returning to judge the servants of his household. Today, we are tempted all the time to inhabit stories, even when we're unconscious of it. Here in the United States, we're conditioned to inhabit the story of the American dream. This is the story that says America is a land of opportunity and a meritocracy. If you work hard enough, obey the laws, and assimilate culturally, you can become a success. You get a good education, get a good job, get a good house, in a good neighborhood, and enjoy the good life. Unfortunately, too many people who profess to be disciples of Jesus today inhabit the story of the American dream more than they inhabit the story of the kingdom of God. Another story that we're tempted to inhabit is a story of partisan political conflict. It's an election year, and we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And this story is the one that says, it's all their fault whoever's fault that is, the blue team, the red team. This is the story that says the most important thing that's going on right now in the world has to do with elephants and donkeys. It's about winning and losing and defeating the other team. But don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that politics are unimportant. I think they are important. But what followers of Christ must remember is that our politics aren't red or blue. Our allegiance is to Jesus. This allegiance manifests in our commitment to seek leaders and policies that bring about the most shalom for the most vulnerable populations in our society. Our politics are about the common good, not the power of any particular political party. In contrast to these types of stories, Jesus invites us to inhabit the story of God's redemptive mission in the world. And Jesus places himself at the center of that story, going all the way back to Abraham. Jesus teaches us that his life, ministry, the healings, the exorcisms, his death, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Holy Spirit are the culmination of God's story of renewing creation, making right all that has gone wrong in God's world. When we are caught up in that story, we are becoming who we are always meant to be. The image of God is being restored in us, and we are, being, we are taking up the calling that we have always intended to have, to be royal priests, stewarding God's creation, reflecting God's loving reign into the creation, and then gathering up the praises of creation and giving them back to God. The parable we heard read today is all about what Jesus is up to, 
when he goes around telling parables. Jesus is the sower who goes out sowing the seed of the word of God. And we collectively are the soils. In fact, the fourth gospel says that Jesus embodies the word of God and makes his dwelling among us. We are those who have gladly received the word, but we live among thorns. Those are the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things. That's why this week, I want to invite us all to wrestle with this parable, with Jesus' words. Let them get under our skin, provoke us, make us think. I invite us to see ourselves as part of this story, God's kingdom breaking into the world through Jesus, and to resist the temptation to inhabit any other story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for inviting us into the reign of God on earth. You are making all things new. Forgive us for the ways we often inhabit other stories and get caught up in their plots. Protect us from the thorns that threaten to choke the word, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. May we be the good soil that produces an abundant harvest of fruit that will last. In your name we pray. Amen.